I want to talk to you this morning in this Easter message on the importance of the foundation of our faith. How many of us are professing Christians? Raise your hand this morning. Or we're professing followers of Jesus. Amen? And our faith is founded on nothing else but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote here, he said, I'm going to read it one more time, that I may know him, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So Paul first is saying, I want to know him. I want to know his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship. I want to be in fellowship with that suffering, being made conformable unto his death. There's two things that I would love to share with you this morning. I know that we're so accustomed to a, a Easter message and we get so excited about the resurrection. Um, but there's two things that I want to speak to you this morning. And first is the word doubt. And the word doubt is very different from the word unbelief. And then in the second part, I want to talk to you about some witnesses that we find in the Bible. We all know uh, a man by the name of Thomas, who, sadly enough, received the name Doubting Thomas, that will stick with him for all eternity. Doubting Thomas. And one of the things that Thomas doubted was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thomas did not pretend to believe when he questioned, and although he was at fault for not believing the testimony of all those that were around him, there may be people today like you and I that carry doubts with us also concerning Christianity or carry doubts concerning the resurrection. And not only about the resurrection of Christ, but also maybe of some of the truths found in the gospel and in other teachings found in the scriptures. But it's important to address this problem of doubt, especially today in Easter, where a lot of people gather in local churches to remember the resurrection of Christ. But there's some that gather not being able to even defend the proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And some gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and he hasn't even lived or been resurrected in the hearts of those people that are hearing the gospel message. But I want to talk to you today is that it is important for us to recognize the value of earnestly doubting. And you're going to say, well, what is this pastor saying? It's okay to doubt. Did you know that? As humans, it's okay to doubt because we go through those emotions. That's how we've been made up. We doubt. Or you believe everything somebody tells you. You're not gullible enough to believe all that. But you begin to question. And sometimes when we read the Scriptures, we also question some of the things that are found in the Scriptures. Especially when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, something that had never taken place prior to this in such a fashion. A man once said, a question mark is simply evidence that a man is beginning to think. That's what a question mark is. However, it's important not to confuse, like I said, doubting and unbelief. They're totally two different things. First, we know that seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness is what Jesus has commanded us to do first. He says, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the person who do does this will soon find that his doubts that trouble him will soon begin to fade away when we seek first Jesus and His kingdom. A man by the name of Horace Bushnell, who was a great preacher, once said, often, and listen to this, he said, often the very thing you can do with your doubts is to hang them up to dry. Listen to what he said. Often what you can do is hang up those doubts to dry. Then when a good time comes, you can take them down to look at them. And in many cases, you will find that somehow they have settled themselves and are no longer doubts. 
That's a part of life. It's important to stress the need to take the testimony of the Scriptures at face value without questioning by faith what is written in the Word of God. How many of us believe this is God's Word? Amen? I'm not talking about a translation. I'm talking about the Scriptures that have been passed down, have been inspired, and have been preserved so that you and I today, by faith, can believe in it. Or how many of us have ever seen Jesus face to face? None of us would raise our hands. But how many of us believe in him by faith? Amen? You know, the writer by the name of Max Lucado, you ever heard of Max Lucado? A while back, he was given a, uh, we were in a meeting, and he was talking about his book, An Applause in Heaven. And Brother Lucado, as he was talking, we sat down and he was saying, you know, he says, I want to tell you how I got the title to that name, An Applause in Heaven. He said, we were sitting down and we were talking to the, the, the author and we were talking to everybody else around and we we're trying to figure out with the marketing team, what name are we going to give this book? And somebody said, An Applause in Heaven. And he said, that's true. Because the book was about our victory when we reach eternity. And he said, the first thing I imagine as we step into the eternal heavenly place that God has prepared for us, that Jesus will look down the aisle and he will say, Nathan, well done. And he said, it will be an applause in heaven heard in all eternity. For that man and that woman who has placed their complete trust in the scriptures. So to the world, that person or that woman that has placed the trust in the scriptures may seem as an ignorant person for those that are intellectuals. May seem as dumb enough to believe in the scriptures. But you and I are dumb enough to believe in the scriptures because what God has done for us. Amen? This is believing without seeing. Jesus told Thomas, and this faith is more blessed than fingertip faith. You know what fingertip faith is? That faith that sometimes you, you want to examine everything to make sure there's a reliable witness, but sometimes you just have to believe by faith. Establishing faith in early years will help us to prevent doubts in later years. This is why we're actively involved in establishing our children in the local church. But you know where the establishment of our children begins and our family begins at home. That's where it begins. Now, we must be taught the value of trusting and believing the reliability of the statements of the Bible, knowing that the promises of God are sure. If Thomas had believed, he would have saved himself a lot of worry. He would have. But Thomas was like you and I. And this is when we read the scriptures and we find out that these men and these women were like you and I. Now, I don't know if I would have been a Thomas. Maybe I would have been a Thomas. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have believed and I would have said, well, I want to see with my own eyes the resurrected Christ. Doubt is a natural part of our human experience. It's a natural part. But it's important to distinguish between earnestly doubting and complete unbelief of the Scriptures. What is the difference between the two of doubt and unbelief? Doubt and unbelief are related, but they're distinct concepts. Doubt refers to a lack of certainty or conviction about something. While unbelief refers to a deliberate refusal to believe in something. Very important. Doubt can be a natural and healthy part of the human experience. And it can lead us to questioning and, and critical thinking. And it will lead us to find an answer. But unbelief, on the other hand, will lead us to reject anything that has to do with the Scriptures. But seeking the kingdom of God in this Easter, trusting in the dependable scriptures of the Bible to help us prevent doubts and establish our faith 
Jesus told Thomas, Bless are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and I. Jesus was speaking to the future. And he's saying, Bless are those that are going to believe in this message that have never seen me. That's you and I. Now, he says, I want to know, he says, Paul says in the beginning that I may know him, but then, then Paul says, but I also want to know, I want to experience the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? If there should be such a thing as regrets in heaven, which there are not going to be, but if there would be such a thing, I'm certain that one of those greatest would be that we did not know Jesus better while we lived here on earth. That goes beyond our intellectual knowledge to a personal relationship and mutual sharing of what Paul said here. Paul desired to experience the power of Christ's resurrection in his own life. Not just in the future, after death. Paul said, I want to experience Jesus now. Not in the future. I want to experience His power now. I want to experience His love now. You ever heard people say, well, you know what? I'm just not ready to walk with God yet. I'm just not ready to accept God yet. Well, when is the time to be ready? Now is the time to be ready. When is the time, Paul said, I want to experience the power of His resurrection now. Now, this goes beyond this. He sought to have fellowship with Christ's sufferings. He sought to feel the love of Christ engulfed in him. It wasn't just an emotion that Paul was feeling. But he said, Paul, in other words, in modern terms, Paul said, I want to experience the true love of Christ that it compasses all understanding. It wasn't shallow emotionalism. You know, sometimes we get emotional. We're emotion, emotional beings. You know, they sing a song and we just, we, we, a brother used to call it glory, glory pimples, he would call it. You just feel glory bubbles all over him. He said, I just feel the, the glory all over me. And, and that's good. Ain't nothing wrong with feeling that. Ain't nothing wrong with feeling a little spark of the Holy Ghost. But it's not about emotionalism. It's about getting closer to God spiritually. Drawing closer to God. Let's join Paul in seeking a deeper communion with Christ this Easter. Let's not be content with just a superficial knowledge of who Jesus is, but really experience Jesus Christ for who He is. Jesus is not just a name figure. You know, to a lot of people out there, Jesus is just a historical figure. Or to, or to the Muslims, He's just a prophet. But He's not just a figure. He's not just a teacher. Listen to what He said. He said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. If you go to YouTube, you look up Bruce Scott and look at his old preaching. He preached at the assembly one time. He said, my grandpa, he said, he used to say this all the time. That when the theologians looked at Jesus when he was 12 and teaching in the temple, they said, little boy. He said, where's your mother and father? He says, who's your mother and father? He said, well. He said, on my mother's side, it's Joseph and Mary. He said, that's who I am. But on my father's side, he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I bet you you watch that, you, you'll get to shouting in that video. Now, he's not just a figure. He's not just a teacher. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the all in all. And religion without Christ as our Savior will be unreal, insignificant, and it will be a simple show. I don't want to live in a simple show. I want the truth of the gospel in me. We must strive for a true and deep relationship with Christ. Now, what happened here in John chapter 20? Go with me to John chapter 20, verse 26 and 29. Now, we're reading a reliable manuscript 
from a man by the name of John, the Gospel of John. And John tells us, as we begin to read the Gospel, that he is a witness of what he is writing to us. John says in chapter 20, in verse 26 through 29, listen to what John says. And after eight days, after his disciples were within, and Thomas was, and Thomas with them. So in other words, they're gathered in a place, Thomas is with him. Then came Jesus, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace unto you. Did you catch everything that just happened in that scripture there? They're in a room. Thomas is with them. It points out to Thomas, because, hey, John knew, hey, he was doubting. Points out to Thomas, and Jesus shows up, and the doors are closed. He had a glorified body. He, he went through the walls. He ate with them. It was amazing what we see here. And in verse 27 says, Then said he to Thomas. Now Jesus looks at Thomas. He says, Reach hither, reach hither thy finger. In other words, give me your finger. Reach in here. And behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand. And thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Listen to what he says to Thomas. In modern terms, come on, my brother. Get your hand, touch my side, look at my, I'm here. Stop not believing. Can you imagine that playing out in your mind? You know, when I read the scriptures, I like to imagine this going on, and I'm looking at Thomas right now, and I'm looking at Thomas, talking to Jesus, and then it says, and Thomas answered, and he didn't have no other words to say but to say what? My Lord and my God. I don't know how he said it. But if I was Thomas, I would have said, my Lord, my God. Not only did Thomas point to us at that moment the divinity of Christ, not only did Thomas point to us there that Jesus is God, but at that moment Thomas recognizes this is him. This is him. This is the one I know. This is the one I've been with. This is the one I walk with. He is here in front of me. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen and thou hast believed. In other words, you only believe because you've seen it, Thomas. But guess what? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are you and I that are here today. Blessed are you and I that believe in Jesus. Blessed are you and I that have gathered to celebrate Easter today. Not just this Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection every single day. It has to be every day. When I wake up, I celebrate the resurrection. When I go to sleep, I celebrate the resurrection. When I'm on my knees, I celebrate it. Why? Because I have believed in the resurrected Christ. And the Bible says that I'm blessed because of that. Isn't that amazing? I'm not talking about material, financial blessings. No, I'm talking about spiritual blessings. And you know what are spiritual blessings? That when we're going through a tough situation, we can get on our knees in that same resurrected Christ can give you the power to stand up even in the midst of the darkest moments in your life. He give you the strength. Amen? I, I don't like to shout a lot, but boy, this make you feel good. Jesus, in verse 26, shows us His glorified body. Jesus shows us his, this wonderful mystery that we desire to understand fully. However, we can only catch a glimpse of this existence. Can you imagine? After the resurrection, he went through walls, he spoke to them, and he even ate with them. What a body. What a resurrected body. That'd be so easy. Wake up on Sunday, be transported straight to Pulaski. You don't have to drive. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Eat all you want. And don't gain no weight. Ah, oh, that's, can't wait for that glorified body, huh? There, I think I would envy Paul there. I would say, I want to experience that body now and not in eternity. I thank the Lord for that. Amen. But guess what? There's some, there's some writers today and even some teachers in the seminaries today that are teaching and preaching Jesus and don't even believe in the resurrection. And they expect us to sit there in a doctrinal class to get our doctors of ministry while they're teaching us, and they're not even saved. 
And some of these teachers today have rather ridiculous conclusions. Listen to some of these. Some of these teachers today suggest that Jesus climbed up a ladder and entered through a window and descended through the roof down the stairway and said, here I am for them to believe. We're talking about do uh, teachers with, doctrine, uh, with doctrinal degrees in religion and philosophy. Others said there's another theory that proposes that Jesus snuck into the house before the doors were locked, and then they let him in right away, and he said, here I am, and he appeared to them. But there's no doubting what we see here. Why? You know, sometimes because of our minds, we don't have infinite minds, we have finite minds. What does that mean? That our minds are limit, and they have a, a capability of comprehending and understanding some things. Now, you ever run into somebody that's super smart? I'm talking about the smartest person you ever know in your life, but has no common sense? Yeah. He's not here, my father-in-law. <laughs> He's a good man. And you know, he wouldn't understand because he don't understand English. <laughs> smartest man in the world. And I tell him sometimes, say, you're the smartest man in the world. I say, you're so smart, but you ain't got no common sense. What's going on with you? Good man, I love my, my, my father-in-law. But what I'm saying is that our minds cannot comprehend and we're limited in our ability to, to understand our cognitive abilities. We can't fully understand the complexities of everything around us, let alone the universe. We can't understand it. Speak to a husband who's been battling with his wife and said, I can't even understand her. Or the wife that says, I can't understand this man. Now, we cannot comprehend those concepts of infinity or the, or the nature of God with these mind or this mind that we have. We're limited in our knowledge. But one day, we shall see Him the way He is. Can't you wait for that day? Isn't that amazing? That day when we walk into eternity and we'll know that it was worth every single bit of suffering that we pass through in this life. Jesus had a glorified body. Now, what does Jesus say to them when he walks in? The first thing that comes out of his mouth is, peace be unto you. This took on a whole new meaning when Jesus said it. Peace be unto you. It should not be taken lightly. This greeting from Jesus was of a one that had conquered death and hell and had come and was truly Fulfilled in all his glory. Death no longer was the ultimate enemy, and the future was no longer dark and hopeless for you and I. Now, let me talk about the faithful witnesses. Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 39 through 43. You know, when you go to a court of law, you are innocent until proven guilty. And we've all seen trials where the public knows, oh, that man is guilty, or that woman is guilty. I remember in Florida years ago, I won't name her name, but years ago in Florida, of a, of a mother who had taken her daughter's life, little girl. And it was so clear, all the lies, everything was so clear that she had done it. But at the end, guess what happened? Not guilty. It was the worst feeling. I remember watching that. I said, I cannot believe this. You, can, you, you know that she did it. You know all these lies that are around it, but they let her go. But if there would have been a witness who would have had substantial evidence of being there, just one could have found her guilty. Now, when Jesus resurrected, there was more than one witness. How many were there? You remember? More than 500 witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. John even said one time, if we were to write everything that Jesus did on earth, we'd have volumes and volumes and volumes of books. But he had witnesses. Acts 10, verse 39 says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, 
whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Listen to verse 40. Him God raised up the third day. So this is Peter speaking here. He says, raised up the third day and showed him openly. Openly, verse 41. Not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God. Even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Listen, this is a witness here that is telling us about after the resurrection. Verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. What does quick and dead mean? Of the, those that are alive and those that are dead. Verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness. So we stop there real quick. What does that mean when he gives all the prophets witness? In other words, everything that was written about him in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament. So the prophets desired to see the day of the coming of Jesus and the resurrection, but they didn't have the, they didn't have the opportunity. But Peter said, we had the opportunity. He says to him, give all the prophets witness through that, through his name. Listen. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. What does verse 40, 39 say? And we are witnesses of all things which he did. This is just one reference to the testimony eyewitness who had actually seen the Lord, observed his life and works. This is why, and I want to say this very important here. This is why in Zion Assembly, we don't have apostles. We don't have prophets. You know, one of the requirements to be an apostle was that you had to be a witness of the resurrection. If somebody today calls himself an apostle, that ain't right because they ain't never seen the resurrection of Christ with their own eyes. That is what an apostle was. They laid down the foundation for us and we're building on top of it through what? Through the scriptures. Now, there are numerous references to the eyewitness of Jesus. Verse 41 says, Not all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God. You and I are faithful witnesses of His resurrection. Through what? Through faith. Just remember who you were before God saved you. You remember who you were before God saved you? Do you think people would recognize you today? I don't think some people would recognize who I was before I was saved. They wouldn't recognize. But you know what? God did something in my life. And we celebrate Easter today, not just because he resurrected, but because through that resurrection, you and I were resurrected from the dead of our sins. We woke up. A while back, in the university, they had us, they had us write a, um, a paper on Socrates and on his writings on, um, it, it was called Shadows on, Shadows on the Wall. And he was talking about the inner eye or the inner vision of one that has something. And then Socrates said that, you know, he illustrated a man that was being controlled by puppets and he opened his eyes and he comes out the cave and he sees life all new again. He's just this great philosophy. And they said, compare this with your writings. So I wrote, and I wrote, Socrates, Socrates copied Jesus. And then I began to talk about the resurrection and what God does in the life of a, a sinner and this and that. And you know what the professor did? He grabbed the paper and said, Nathan, this is an F. And I'll never forget that. I said, what? You can't compare Jesus to this. I said, well, you got it all wrong, man. I said, because all he did was copy Jesus. And I shared with him what the Bible said. But you know what? I just quit the class and I left. And I thought and it always stayed with me about this man. And I pray for him because the scriptures are clear to us. There's enough evidence. There's enough substantial evidence that Jesus was real. He died on the cross, and he resurrected on the third day. We're not going to leave him on the cross. We're going to put him in our hearts. Sister Rachel, if you can help me. We're going to continue to have him in our hearts. And in verse 43, it says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, 
whosoever believeth in him shall receive what? Remission of sins. Not by man. Not by anybody else. But by the word of God. I want you to rise with me in this morning. Amen.